I forget. Um, but Christy, it is all yours now. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, so typically when I do a conference presentation, I focus on things that are practical and hands-on. I look to what I'm doing in my daily work and, um, and I use that as a basis for my presentation. So it kind of makes me wonder, like, why would I pick such a peculiar topic <laughs> to focus on now? So I want to give you all a little bit of background on it. And first of all, I'm delighted that so many people are here and so many people share my interest in this. So I just wanted to start off by providing a little context. So um, I am Christy Allen. I'm an assistant director at Furman University's library. And like all of us, my life went through a big upheaval with the COVID-19 restrictions, um, and all the changes that happened. Um, starting in March, my second grader was suddenly uh, attending school at home using his Chromebook. Suddenly I was working at home full time. And out of health concerns, we pulled my uh, two-year-old daughter out of daycare and so she was home with us. So we had four people in a house trying to hold down our full-time jobs, trying to raise our kids, trying to make sure school got done. It was a crazy time and it continues to be a crazy time. And somewhere in the midst of all those frustrations and meltdowns, most of which were admittedly mine, I found myself really struggling to keep it together. And so the, the sort of background of why this topic even became of interest to me was like one afternoon, just like running around trying to do three different things at once. The TV's on, my son's kind of watching it, chilling out. And then I hear this voice, this elderly male voice coming from the TV. And he said with absolute certainty, a good librarian is a calm librarian. And in that moment, I just stopped everything I was doing and I laughed out loud because it couldn't have been farther from the truth. Um, and so it turned out that the voice, whoops, sorry, the, the voice on the TV that I was hearing was an actress, or I'm sorry, an actor. Um, named Neil Hamilton, and he was playing Commissioner Gordon on the 1960s Batman TV show. And, oops, sorry, I lost my, my notes here. So that simple quote made me kind of stop and think, not just about my life in general and how crazy and hectic it was, but also how were libraries and librarians portrayed in that TV show? So, you know, in an attempt to um, focus on something a little more positive and interesting and fun, I spent a lot of the last five months of self-isolation caused by COVID in re-watching um, the classic TV show with my eight-year-old son and really enjoying it for its canty silliness, but also looking more deeply in how libraries and librarians were portrayed. And I figured that I would go ahead and present some of my interesting findings to y'all, um, perhaps you're fans of the TV show, and you can get a little um, insight into maybe some of the, the ways that libraries and librarians are shown in the 1960s. I think most of us sort of have that stereotype in mind that, you know, in popular media librarians are elderly or middle-aged spinster women with glasses and hair in a bun. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how perhaps the portrayal of librarians wasn't quite that in this TV show. And also um, some of the ways that just the space of a library is represented and how it's sort of folded into the TV show. I will say most of the um, the work that I'm doing with this TV show really focuses on season three. So there were three seasons of the TV show from uh, 1966 through 1968. And the reason that I really focused on the third season was because that's when they introduced the character of Batgirl. And Batgirl's secret identity is Barbara Gordon, who is the daughter of the police commissioner and also a librarian. And so with her coming to the show, you start seeing librarians and libraries portrayed much more frequently. I have done a quick overview of seasons one through two, and I didn't see a whole lot about 
um, about libraries or librarians, maybe some references here or there, with one notable exception. There was a two-parter in season one with Dylan was Bookworm, and he actually walked around in leather binding and had like a reading lamp attached to his leather hat. And he drove around in a bookmobile, of course. And at one point he was trying to rob um, what they called the Morgan Built Library, which held um, seven Gutenberg Bibles and 11 first folios of William Shakespeare. But beyond that storyline, you don't really see libraries or librarians appear regularly until you hit season three. So that was really my, the main focus of my research. So just for a little bit of background, um, so Barbara Gordon as a character, as Batgirl, was first introduced in the comics, uh, Detective Comics number 359, which was published on November 29th, 1966, but had a cover date of January 1967. Um, in September of 1967, she appeared in the TV show. This was no coincidence that the character was launched in the comic books and on TV around the same time. The producer of the show actually went to DC Comics and said, hey, I would love if we could reboot this old forgotten character of Batgirl who appeared in the 1950s under a different secret identity and a whole different um, personality. If we could kind of reboot that, rebrand her, make her perhaps related to Commissioner Gordon and give her a much stronger storyline. And so kind of working together, DC and the producer of the TV show came up with this concept. And so she was launched first in the comics and then in the TV show. There are some significant differences between how she's portrayed in those two mediums, and I'm not really going to get into that. I'm really going to focus on how she was portrayed in the TV show. And I love this picture on this slide because this is Yvonne Craig, who is the actress that plays Batgirl, actually reading Detective Comics number 359 in which Batgirl's character appears for the first time. So I think that's just a really lovely um, tying together of the comics and the TV show. So the as I said, librarians and librarians appear quite frequently in season three, and I'm going to kind of break down how um, how they appear and focus on different aspects throughout my um, presentation. And the first, most important, <laughs> is obviously Barbara Gordon herself. So Barbara Gordon is the daughter of the police commissioner, and she is a college graduate with a four-year degree. It's never said in the TV show what degree she holds. Um, bachelors of Library Science were not unknown in the 1960s. They did happen, although MLSs were perhaps much more common, but it's never specifically said that she holds a library degree, but it's never specifically said that she doesn't either. Um, she is described in the very first episode in which she appears, which is Enter Batgirl, Exit Penguin, as one of the newer librarians at the library. So she is not the newest librarian, because I think they would have said that, but she is also not um, holding a very prominent position, perhaps. Um, whereas in the comics, it's my understanding that she was the director of the library. In this show, she is simply one of many librarians doing their job. Um, and of course, her secret identity is Batgirl. And here in this picture, again, you see Barbara Gordon as a librarian compared to her alter ego, bad girl. I just want to take a moment here to kind of address maybe some stereotypes. Again, you know, people often thought of librarians as middle-aged or older women, glasses, bun. And as you can see in this picture, Barbara Gordon has none of those. Although she does wear reading glasses in the TV show, you'll see her take them on and off almost always when she's in the library, coincidentally, um, but she does not wear glasses all the time. And her hair is very um, stylish and modern in the 1960s. And while it sort of looks like an updo, it is actually just short hair styled to look like that. It is not a bun. Um, in terms of the way she dresses, she often dresses in bright, attractive colors. Her jewelry is always very simple and plain. She'll wear feminine blazers, a lot of A-line skirts, um, a lot of what she's wearing in this picture, which is like a matching sort of mock turtleneck and skirt, and always um, sensible heels. 
So that, that's kind of how she's portrayed, which is perhaps a little different than we might think of librarians being portrayed, especially um, in the 1960s. So let's kind of go through a little bit about Barbara Gordon. So I looked through these different episodes to try to figure out like what she did as a librarian, what was her job? And it became clear to me throughout this that she is a reference librarian. So you see her in multiple episodes answering reference questions for patrons, both in person and over the phone. Um, you see her tracking down hard to find resources. In fact, one of the librarians when talking to um, Batman about Barbara Gordon said that there's practically nothing that she couldn't find and that she knows the collection better than any other librarian there. Um, she has been known to go out to other branches of libraries to do research to find materials that patrons need. Um, and, and she's also been known to hand deliver materials. So for example, uh, a professor at the Gotham Museum needed a rare book about dinosaurs and she was able to track it down and then hand delivered it to the museum for him. So kind of going above and beyond in locating resources and getting them into the hands of her patrons. Um, we see her shelving books. We see her dusting and cleaning library shelving. And there are also um, different episodes where she's working at different times. So we see her working sometimes during the day, sometimes working at night, sometimes starting her shift around noon. And um, we have heard from at least one librarian who said that she worked for a full month with no break. So presumably working weekends too. Um, she just has that level of dedication. And here in this picture, you see her doing a bunch of research about a very particular scientist that she's trying to find information on. And you see she just has stacks of books of various sizes and ages. So I was also really curious about her knowledge. What, what is her background? What are her specialties? Um, she describes herself in one episode as a student of history, which may suggest that rather than holding a library degree, she perhaps holds a degree in history. Um, this pans out in several episodes when she talks about being an Egyptian bibliophile, when she talks about knowledge of the history of Southwest Asia, when she is a fan of paleontology. She really seems to focus on the history of the world, both natural and cultural. That seems to be something that they reference again and again in the show. However, they also talk in one episode about her knowledge of poetry, um, in which she is quoting a poem and then Robin is able to successfully cite not only the name of the poem, the author, but also the specific stanza that it appears in. And she compliments him for his deep knowledge of classical literature. Um, she is also has knowledge of biology. In one episode when she and Batman are looking through a microscope, she's able to identify not only that what she's looking at is bacteria, but also able to identify the species of bacteria it is, which I think is kind of funny. And then finally, her knowledge of surf lingo <laughs> seems a little bizarre in this context, but there is perhaps an infamous episode in which Batman and Joker have a engage in a surfing contest. And Barbara Gordon and Dick Grayson, who is Robin's secret identity, basically narrate the entire surfing contest using very specific surfing lingo. They're able to identify what moves they're doing um, and that sort of thing. So it it's kind of seems a little at odds with some of her more historical classical education, but there you go. She's good at surf lingo. Um, and her skills, obviously the number one thing is she has fighting skills, but her fighting skills, if you remember from the show, are not the traditional punching and roundhouse kicks. What she does is actually much more acrobatic and influenced by dance. It may um, not surprise you to learn that the actress who portrayed Batgirl is in fact a dancer. And so you often see Batgirl in her fighting styles, pirouetting, and doing um, high kicks like you might see the Rockets do. <laughs> um, you see her being lifted up sometimes by Robin, sometimes by Batman, and sometimes by both of them, almost as if 
a male ballet dancer would lift a female one so that she may spin and swirl and flout her cape and kick in very um, acrobatic dance styles. She's also very skilled in the use of technology and gadgets. Her gadgets, while they are not as good as Batman's, certainly rival them. She has um, detectors that can detect radiation. She has tracking devices. She has um, lasers and cutters and all kinds of things that she mysteriously pulls out of her um, utility belt just in the nick of time when she needs them. She also has a passing knowledge of first aid. When her father and Chief O'Hara were incapacitated once and fell to the floor after being attacked by a crib, she was able to um, administer first aid to them. And in fact, Chief O'Hara described her as a regular Florence Nightingale. She rides a motorcycle. As you can see in this picture, this is the Batgirl cycle. It is somewhat strange in its design, perhaps by today's modern standards. It's very feminine with lots of frills. It has lace on it. It almost reminds me of a petticoat, perhaps. Um, but she, that is her, um, that is her vehicle of choice, and she drives it in nearly every episode. And finally, she plays the flute. This is seen in one episode where Batman, Robin, and Batgirl basically have to serve as um, the Pied Pipers of Gotham City leading exploding mechanical rats out of the city so that they can jump into the dock and um, diffuse themselves. It's not something that is ever referenced again in terms of her musical abilities, but it is seen in that one episode where she is successfully playing the flute. And then finally, I just want to talk a little bit about her characteristics. So she is smart, um, which is not surprising. Oftentimes people will reference something, whether it be one of the Riddler's riddles or um, one of a quote that King Tut gave about an obscure Egyptian poem. And she can recall what people are talking about. She's quick in terms of just her mental capacities and smart and is able to recall things pretty quickly. So smart and has a good memory. She's generally punctual. I will say generally, because there are at least two episodes in which she claims that she will be late for her shift in the library because of extenuating circumstances, whether she was held up at gunpoint in her apartment, whether she was kidnapped, um, or whether she ran into some kind of um, criminal enterprise, or when she was being bad girl and trying to stop crime. So generally punctual but perhaps late sometimes for her library shift. Um, she is certainly loyal. She is very kind and caring to her father. She shows a lot of dedication to him. Um, they say that they, the, the two of them only got in a fight one time in their entire lives. She's a caring daughter. But at the same time, she has a lot of confidence and bravado. So on the one hand, she may seem like a doting daughter, kind and sweet. But on the other hand, she's not afraid to be confident about her opinions and in the guise of bad girl to boast about her accomplishments and how good she is. At one point, um, there were five criminals who were attacking her all at once. And Batman says, well, that hardly seems fair. And she said, what are you talking about? This is fun you know, kind of boasting about how she could easily take down five men by herself. But even as Barbara Gordon, she's certainly very confident. When she knows something to be true, she stands her ground. She doesn't back down. She's not a wallflower. I think it's important to note that she is also deceptive. I mean, she's lying about who she is. So as Batgirl, she keeps her secret identity close. There have been many times when she's lied about where she's gotten sources of information to protect those who are helping her, um, but also to keep secret her true identity as Barbara Gordon. And of course, the reverse is true too. As Barbara Gordon, she talks about Batgirl in the third person and she never admits or even hints she is truly Batgirl. Um, at one point, a workman came into her apartment and was getting close to figuring out how to get into her secret revolving wall that had her Batgirl disguise and everything. And she was able to trick and confuse him to the point where he didn't realize that the secret closet was there and what it contained. So again, playing into that deception. 
She is fearless. There have been many, many times where she will run headlong into a bad guy's hideout with absolutely no backup. And many of those times she will find herself overwhelmed and knocked out and kidnapped. But she never learns her lesson. She keeps going back. <laughs> so she has that sense of fearlessness. Even as Barbara Gordon, there have been, I believe, three times when criminals have walked into her library and she has walked up to them and challenged them, insulted them and asked them to leave. Um, one perhaps very notable um, example of her fearlessness is um, the penguin walks into the library, goes up to a display case, cuts a hole into it, takes out the book um, that he's going to steal. She runs right over, confronts him, pulls it out of his hand, and says that he has absolutely no right to take that library book. At which point he um, somewhat seriously responds that it's a public library and he's part of the public and he has every right to any book in it. And she basically orders him out and says that she's gonna call the police. So to get back at her for not letting him look at this rare book, he puts an umbrella bomb in the umbrella stand at the library. So Barbara hears it ticking. So of course the first she, thing she does is call her father, <laughs> the police commissioner, and says, there's this ticking umbrella in my umbrella stand. And the commissioner says, why are you still there? Get the heck out, it's a bomb, it's gonna explode. And she says, a librarian never leaves her library. And she stays and waits for Batman and Robin to come and defuse the bomb. So fearless, perhaps a little crazy, of, it's interesting to note that there was no mention of her evacuating the patrons during this, so I'm not quite sure what was going on. <laughs> I hope that the library was closed, because if not, I think that that might, we might also add poor judgment to Barbara Gordon's list of characteristics if she let her patrons remain in the library when there was a, a real bomb that was about to explode. And both as Barbara Gordon and as Batgirl, we see she's very passionate in what she believes in and is not afraid to get excited about things that she really loves. And that passion comes through throughout the show. It's really delightful to watch her both as an excited and excitable librarian and as Batgirl who can take on five men and think it's exciting. Okay, whoop. So Batgirl isn't the only librarian that we see in the show. There are four others that appear in season three. They all appear to be, fe they're all female, and they all appear to be colleagues of Barbara Gordon, and most appear to work in the reference section. So the very first one we see is Priscilla. She's in the first episode with Batgirl, and um, she is actually answering the phone at Barbara Gordon's desk because the little name tag says Barbara Gordon. So this is the reference desk um, and she's answering the phone for the Gotham Library. Um, and then the next uh, librarian we see is Myrtle, who is also, who actually, it's unclear if she's a reference librarian. What we do know is that she comes in bringing in a box that was addressed to Barbara Gordon. So she brings it to her desk, opens it, finds a stuffed penguin inside and then fiddles with it until it releases a noxious gas that knocks her out. <laughs> so poor Myrtle is probably not the brightest, especially when Barbara says, please stop messing with that. It's probably from the penguin. And he is not a big fan of me right now. Um, and then we also see Petula. Um, so Petula is a reference librarian. She is sitting at the desk and, um, Barbara comes up to her and actually asks her a reference question. She asks about whether or not they hold a particular periodical. And when Petula said, no, remember last year when the city council reduced our budget, we had to, to stop subscribing to that, which I like as a librarian, it made me a little happy to see them talking about things like library budgets and periodicals and having to cancel subscriptions. I thought that really rung true as a fellow librarian. Um, so Petula was sitting at the reference desk and answering questions for Barbara and was actually able to tell her where she could get a copy of the periodical since the Gotham City Library no longer subscribed to it. It was in um, Bruce Wayne's house. Apparently Bruce Wayne is the only person who subscribes to more periodicals than the Gotham Public Library. 
And then the final librarian we see, she's never named. She is tied up um, and left in the library um, in the Egyptian scroll section when the uh, when the villain King Tut breaks into the library and steals all the rare and ancient Egyptian scrolls. And he ties her up in such a way that if she moves at all, she could die. And so Batman and Robin untie her. And the very first thing she says is, you need to get those scrolls back. They're ancient, they're priceless. And the police told me that you were supposed to protect us, Batman. So like, what gives? <laughs> like, why? where were you when all these scrolls were stolen? So she's, um, She's particularly feisty, even having just stared death in the face. I think it is kind of funny that despite these admonishings from this particular librarian, later in the episode when Batman and Robin do encounter King Tut and fight with him, the scrolls are on a table and Batman and Robin break the table and start hitting the bad guys with the scrolls. I do not think this unknown librarian would have been very happy with them had she seen that. So Batman and Robin are perhaps not as concerned about the condition of these um, library materials as this poor librarian down here is. So those are the other librarians that we see. All of them are women, as you can see. Only one of them had a bun, and that is Myrtle, and none of them wore glasses. So I think that, again, that speaks that, that kind of throws um, a monkey wrench into perhaps some of the stereotypes we typically see. And all of them are dressed fairly conservatively, but also elegantly. None of them I would consider to be dowdy or frumpy by any sense of the, of the word. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the public library. So the Gotham Public Library, um, you usually only see this one shot of it. So this one interior shot of it and that's with this line of books and with this inspirational um, wording along the back that says onward and upward forever and then a small reference slash circulation desk that's kind of tucked off to the side that is Barbara Gordon's desk because her name is on it. There are also a couple of tables in the space so I can assume that it's some kind of a small reading room. Um, the Gotham Public Library has collections of books, obviously, but it also has manuscripts. Um, there are rare poems there, one of which was stolen by Catwoman in one episode. We've got the Ancient Egyptian Scrolls, which our unknown librarian said is typically protected by a police detail because they are so rare. And yet they are not locked up, they are left out on open shelving. So perhaps the librarians at Gotham Public Library may wish to rethink <laughs> how they protect their rare materials. They do have periodicals and they also have microfilm, which figures into a specific episode where Barbara was looking for a poem, realized that it had been stolen by Catwoman. And then luckily the Gotham Public Library um, has micro copies of all of their materials. So she was able to go to the microfilm reader and access the content of the poem, figure out it was a riddle to, um, to a, uh, a treasure trove of gunpowder that the Catwoman was gonna steal and then use to um, break into the Gotham City Mint. So microfilm saved the day in that episode. The services of the Gotham Public Library are, as you may, think. We see reference and research um, alluded to many times in the show. We see that it has open stacks because we see people like um, uh, King Tut in the open stacks. We see Louis the Lilac. Um, so many criminals come in and out and browse through books. And in one episode, we even see a Martian who is using the library. Although he's not very kind to the books, he rips them off the shelf, throws them on the floor, and then scampers away which causes Barbara Gordon to scream. It's unclear if it was because he was an alien or if what because of what he was doing to her collection. Um, the other services they provide is, as I mentioned before, they do hand deliver materials to other buildings and places um, like the, the Gotham Museum. And finally, they circulate. So there are a couple episodes where you see librarians stamping books with due dates and closing them up. 
which is very nice. You do not see Barbara doing that though. Um, I believe uh, Petula was the librarian who was doing it in that case. So the if you the exterior of the Gotham Public Library is shown twice in the third season, and both times it is a picture of the New York Public Library. You see the um, the quintessential lions on either side and the big steps and the columns and stuff like that. So, you know, again, kind of hearkening back to the fact that Gotham City is very much like a New York City. Again, the interior. So the design of the uh, Gotham Public Library on the inside, it has this lovely bright blue paint. It's got wooden wainscoting and wooden shelves. It's got the inspirational onward and upward forever quote. Um, it's got framed posters on the wall with information. As far as I can tell from squinting at the TV screen, it appears to be related to science. So maybe geology or different time periods in natural history. Um, it has a reference desk that is very small with a little flappy door on one side and open for walking in and out and around on the other. Um, and that reference desk is also Barbara Gordon's desk because it has her name plate on it. Um, it's got a comfortable green swivel chair that it sits beside. It's got um, a mat on the desk with a couple of date, due date stamps and a phone and a stack of index cards with some writing materials. So that that is the extent of what we see of um, of that sort of reading room of the Gotham Library. We also occasionally see display cases. They seem to be um, maybe like four foot, you know, long, not very big, surrounded by glass and on legs. And we see those in two different cases, or I'm sorry, in two different episodes. And they seem to move around. So they're, they're not static. They're not typically in the space, but sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. So I guess they move around depending on what displays are done. Um, a couple of other spaces that we see is this sort of little alcove where the Egyptian scrolls are kept. And then um, that alcove is sort of surrounded by books on Egyptology, which based on the fact that Barbara was dusting the books um, and her comment to Bruce Wayne, they don't see much use at all. Um, so again, those are the spaces that we see. One thing of note that I thought was really interesting was that the Gotham Public Library does have a ladies lounge, which Myrtle the Librarian references after she gets knocked flat with the noxious penguin gas and she has to go sort of um, recline and recover. So ladies lounges were not uncommon in the 60s in different libraries. Um, I know that Furman University had one before we renovated um, about 20 years ago. Um, so it's just interesting and a little bit of um, uh, history of library spaces, I guess, to, to, to learn that Gotham Public Library had one as well. All right, so what happens in the public library? So I, I did a quick count of different episodes and what is actually happening there. And unfortunately, 30% of the time when we see the Gotham Library, it is because a crime is being committed. Um, we've had penguins steal books, attempt or actively steal books from there twice. We've had King Tut steal scrolls. We've had Catwoman steal a manuscript. We've had penguin put bombs in it. Um, so quite a lot of crime happening at the poor Gotham Public Library. 25% um, of the time we see research happening and that research is typically being conducted by Barbara Gordon herself. And that could be research that she's conducting for herself to help case, or it could be research that she's conducting on behalf of a patron. Um, but we also see Batman using the library in one of the episodes where he was using the who's who in alchemy to um, identify the secret identity and the family history of Dr. Cassandra, who was their latest um, villain that they were fighting that week. Um, so then we also see conversations among librarians and then conversations between librarians and patrons. And then finally, we have a category, what I call other. And the other category includes things like Martians appearing in the library. <laughs> Only happen once and is sort of oddball. Um, 
so that's kind of how the library is used as uh, as a storytelling tool within the the third season so i just wanted to loop back around since we kind of get to the end here about the quote so I was first inspired to look into it because of Commissioner Gordon's quote about a good librarian being a calm librarian. So what was the context of that quote um, and why was it so important? So the context was that Barbara Gordon went to college with, a, with one of her friends named Selma. And again, no mention is made of uh, what uh, degree either of them was in pursuit of. But Selma kind of became, fell in love with the flower child movement and became a flower child herself and renamed herself Princess Primrose and was organizing what they called a flower in, a big festival with lots of flowers and love and making music in very, very 1960s. And Barbara witnesses Selma or Princess Primrose being kidnapped by the local mobster Louis the Lilac and so she goes to her father and she says he you know my friend's been kidnapped can you do something and her father just totally brushes it off it's it's very rude and inconsiderate actually it was like oh no i'm sure she went with him willingly why would louis the lilac abduct her it doesn't make any sense you know these these flower children they're all kind of loopy anyways they're all doing their own thing and so barbara gets really upset about it and she's like look you got to take me seriously and his response is a good librarian is a calm library, which I know if I was in that situation, having someone talk to me like that, I would be very, very angry. So once her father leaves the room, she goes over to his office and she picks up the red bat phone and she calls Bannon and says, look, Princess Primrose was abducted by Louis de Lilac. Something funky is going on and you need to look into it. And Batman does. He investigates it. When Commissioner Gordon finds out that his daughter called Batman and asked him to look into it, and Batman actually did, Commissioner Gordon got very angry. And in fact, it precipitated the only fight between the two that they've ever had in their entire lives because Commissioner Gordon felt like it wasn't Barbara's place to call Batman and that um, she was sort of, you know, taking away his authority or whatever. And so it's a very interesting power dynamic between the two of them. They do eventually reconcile. And it turns out, of course, that Barbara was right and that Princess Primrose was being used by Louis the Lilac. He was trying to experiment on her using some sort of brainwashing flower scented perfume that would make all the flower children follow him around and sort of give him a little flower child army. Um, so, so that was the context of the quote and knowing more about that context, um, I thought it made me a little angrier actually <laughs> than just hearing it as I'm running around frantically trying to do my stuff. So the, I thought one other quote that was worth mentioning here was, um, well, actually, I don't know if my screen is taking all this in. Yeah, I think I think maybe you're it's cutting off the, the response down there. But um, so Batman and Batgirl are having this conversation and Batman says, well, perhaps crime fighting is better left to the men. Perhaps not. But this isn't exactly woman's work. And then Batgirl's retort is, but I am no ordinary woman, Batman. And it's true. She's not. Um, She's not just a crime fighter. She's not just someone who is good at giving her high kicks and her spinning pirouette punches, but she's also a librarian. She's an excellent researcher. She's well-respected in her field, well-respected by her colleagues. People come to her when they can't find materials because she can find anything. And she tracks things down successfully and great. So, um, so yeah, I think Batgirl is right that she is no ordinary woman. The last thing I wanted to show you all, and I don't know if this is going to work or not. Um, we'll we'll have to see. So this is actually a clip from an unaired pilot from Batgirl that was made in between the end of season two and the beginning of season three. So this is when 
the producer of the show was trying to pitch to ABC, hey, we want to add this new character, and she's Batgirl, and here's a little um, pilot of what she can do and how, like, how she transforms into Batgirl and that sort of thing. So the pilot itself was set in a library. Um, Barbara Gordon is helping Bruce Wayne with a reference request. They're talking. Um, and then Killer Moth, who is a villain that's never seen in any of the other uh, Batman TV shows, but he's in this little unaired pilot, attempts to kidnap someone within the library and to get Barbara out of the way to kind of shove her in the ladies' lounge. And at that point, she transforms into Batgirl. And you'll notice that her costume is actually different in the unaired pilot compared to what they actually ended up going with when they made season three. But I really like this because this fight happens in the library and it shows Barbara using books and library materials to fight bad guys, which is actually kind of opposite of how, what her character would have done as it's portrayed in season three. You never see her ab like actively abusing library materials or the state itself. She has a lot of respect for that. Um, and so I just thought this was fun. So we'll try and see if it'll work. Holy apparition. No boy wonder I'm that girl. You are no longer alone, Kate Crusader. <laughs> Who is she? Where'd you come from? No idea. Now to get you out of those tilt straight jacks. All right. So I don't know if you could hear the sound, <laughs> um, but you know there wasn't a whole lot of talking going on. Basically, poor Batman and Robin are caught in a cocoon from Killer Moth, and so Batgirl jumps in to save him. At one point, she takes one of the long wooden poles that have the newspapers hanging off of them and hits a bad guy with it. At another point, she just grabs a line of books and throws it right at their faces. And then at another point when she kicks him and they fall back into the bookshelf, the whole bookshelf falls on the bad guys. My thought upon watching this is, oh my God, <laughs> Barbara, you're ruining your library. What are you thinking? But it is, it is a lot of fun. And it's interesting that the creators of the show ended up never doing anything like that in season three. They never used the library as a space that Barbara would willingly go in and use books and materials um, to fight bad guys and potentially destroy her collection. So I think even between this unaired pilot and the way her character was represented in the third season changed a little bit. All right, so here's some references I used, just um, acknowledging them. Uh, the pictures that I, that I used throughout here, most of them came from Yvonne Craig's website, YvonneCraig.com, that's the actress who played Batgirl. And the remainder of them were actually screenshots that I took on my phone when pausing <laughs> the TV episodes because there are not a whole lot of um, pictures specifically of Batgirl and the other librarians. So the quality of them is a little is a little rough. But that's all I have. And um, I know that we have a little time left, so I'm more than happy to uh, to take questions or have any comments. Christy, I don't see any questions, but I will say this was so interesting and I didn't know much about Batgirl. So now I'm going to have to watch season three to, to learn all about Batgirl because this was so interesting. So thank you so much. 
Thank you very much. It's certainly a lot of fun. I know that the, the seasons are available on Vudu. You do have to purchase them, I believe, though. Um, if you, well, we, we own the DVD copies, and I think we got free access through Vudu because we have the DVDs, but I think if you don't, you do have to purchase them. But um, all three seasons are available on there, and it's just a lot of fun. The unaired pilot is free, actually, and it is available on the Internet Archive, so anyone who wants to go on there and watch at least that little unaired pilot, I think it's like seven or eight minutes long, can do so as well. All right, it looks like we have a question from Wesley Sparks, who says the only other librarian here that I'm aware of is the librarian from the TBS series. Do you know of any others? Um, so there is an article, let's see here, if I can get back to my presentation. I have multiple screens open here. I may not be able to get my mouse down there, but there's an article by Doug Highsmith um, that I reference in my presentation where he actually went through and he identified all the major librarian characters that appeared in comics. And so of course Batgirl was a major one, but I think there was also Captain Comet, who I'd never heard of before. I believe he was a, a Marvel superhero. He also talks about Rupert Giles from Buffy the Vampire Slayer because there are Buffy comics um, and how he is portrayed. Um, Poor Giles, though, he, uh, his library got really beaten up throughout the course of the, of the Buffy series. Um, and I'm trying to think if there were others. I feel like there may have been one of the girlfriends of the Green Lantern was a librarian. So there are a few. There are not many. I think Barbara Gordon was the most prominent one. I think for me, my next steps is I'm really curious to see how she's portrayed in the comics and how that compares to her portrayal in the um in the tv show because from what i've read in the comics she is the director of the public library and she's also has a phd in library science which is very impressive um and i'm just curious like how long she was a librarian because there's a point where um her character undergoes a change and then she becomes a congresswoman and so they, they sort of changed and morphed her character over time. And then um, at one point, of course, they, uh, Batgirl becomes Oracle, which, who is another superhero, but it's unclear if she is still the same Barbara Gordon with the library background or if she's the Congresswoman background. So I'm just kind of curious. I want to dig a little more into that and learn more about her as a character and the role that libraries play both within the comics and in the TV show. Um, but yeah, those are the librarians that I could think of off the top of my head that are heroes. Oh, I guess one last thing. I don't think that you can really see it on my screen, but I am wearing a Batgirl t-shirt here. So I was able to get this on Amazon and it is the Yvonne Craig version of Batgirl. So my daughter and I have matching t-shirts of Yvonne Craig Batgirl. So if you're a fangirl like I am, they're on Amazon and you can pick them up for pretty inexpensive. All right, it looks like, oh, thank you for your references. That's very helpful. <laughs> um, but I think that's it. And this recording will be on YouTube. So if anyone wants to watch this again later, I know I probably will, um, they can find it on YouTube. But Christy, thank you so much. This was so interesting and I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you everyone for joining.